and this is Talking Books. Welcome to Talking Books. I'm Neil Armstrong. It's a, it's a lovely, lovely day outside. And our, our guest today is Mohammed um, Abdul Karim Ali, who is the author of Angry Queer Somali Boy, a Complicated Memoir, published by the University of Regina Press in 2019. This is his first book. Mohammed was born in Mogadishu, Somalia, and lived in the United Arab Emirates and the Netherlands before immigrating to Canada as a teenager. He currently lives in Toronto. And our panelists, as usual, are Courtney McFarlane, who is a Jamaica-born visual artist, poet, and spoken word performer, whose work has been published in several African-Canadian and queer anthologies, and Dr. Christopher Smith, who is currently a research associate at the Center for Ethics at the University of Toronto with the Race, Ethics and Power Project. They are also a sessional lecturer in the program in Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Toronto, Scarborough. And Dr. Lance McCready will join us shortly. He's the lead researcher for the Making Spaces Lab and an associate professor in the Department of Leadership higher and adult education at the Ontario Institute for Studies in, Ed in Education and director of the transitional year program at the University of Toronto. Welcome, welcome all and a special welcome to you, Mo. Thank you for having me. Mohammed is fine with us calling him Mo, so you will hear the reference to Mo throughout the, our conversation. And it really is a conversation. We invite you to participate you can ask your your questions in the chat in the chat uh, section of, of your screen uh, we're asking you to keep your video on but to turn your audio off and uh, we'll take your questions through the chat now mo your memoir is is one that i read and had to, to read again to make sure I wasn't missing anything. It, it throws a wide window open into your life. It involved a lot of travel <laughs> internally and externally to understand and accept who you are, your circumstances, the places you've lived. And there are experiences of trauma, but there are also moments of joy. And I, I want to start by asking you to, to read an excerpt of your memoir, and then we will we'll take it from there. What have you chosen? Um, so for today, I will be reading one short and one longer chapter. And the first one is entitled The Great White North. Mm -hmm. And um, first of all, thank you, Neil, for having me here today. <clears throat> um, the Great White North. Paranoia as an African condition was written into the music of my soul. Fathers working abroad and mothers worrying their husbands had a lover or worse, a second wife. The neighbors were aunties, but they couldn't see you slip. Don't fuck up. When such warnings were uttered in Somali, my body seized up. Paranoia about police, teachers, social workers, and other elements of the system. The fear of God was put in me when I learned what happened in the unbelievers' jails. Make friends, but don't tell them what goes on at home. I was told to avoid Western culture, but absorb all the erudition it produced. Pr pressure to do well heightened my anxiety. Photos of Brother Siad hung on the wall, but he was condemned for subduing a rebellious clan. The collective schizophrenia was intense, but the bonds held most of the time. In Canada, I noticed that children of Trinis, Guineans, Ethiopians, and Jamaicans had the same concerns with minor adjustments for cultural differences. Anxiety about being swallowed whole by, anti by antagonizing social forces. The African, be they within or without Africa, furnished internal space with beauty and caution. A moment is nigh in which we, from Réunion to the south side of Chicago, once again shall have a eureka moment. I hope Kwame Nkrumah, a hero to all Africans, is holding hands with Malcolm X, Hans Fanon, Nina Simone, and Miriam Makeba on the banks of heavenly streams. Bienvenue à Toronto. On arrival in Toronto, 
I looked at the airport and took in the bland landscape around Airport Road. Years later, I discovered the blandness obscured countless strip clubs and steakhouses. In those unremarkable spaces, businessmen entered into deals and rewarded themselves with strippers and mountains of cocaine. I felt a rush as we glided across the highway. The trucks avoided the barriers with mechanical grace. My aunt picked us up in her purple Dodge Caravan, which I discovered was the Somali mode of private transport in the 416. This was Samira's sister who waited for us at Heathrow back in 1991. She emigrated from the United Kingdom because of something that happened to a young girl, the child of a very religious family, in the care of my aunt. She left the child, she left the child alone with her husband. The little girl returned home withdrawn and her family became worried. She revealed what happened. My aunt's husband had helped himself to her innocent body. Her family gathered at my aunt's house and threatened her husband. He happened to be out, perhaps ruining more lives. Molesting young girls was his real vocation. My aunt's, my aunt's family departed from the United Kingdom that night and resettled in Toronto, where he worked at a car rental business at Pearson Airport. We pulled into Four Winds Drive, a desolate patch of North York. North York used to be its own city until it was forced into a marriage with Etobicoke, York, Scarborough, Old Toronto, and East York to form the mega city I had just landed in. Apparently, in Canada, cities are corporations owned by the province. Odd. Her building was 10 stories high near a giant oil plant, aptly named the Keel Street Tank Farm. On the other side of the building were grassy field, hydro lines, and community gardens. Off in the distance were giant brutalist blocks with long metallic chimneys. I asked her what they were. York, it's the university here. Isn't it ugly? We huddled into the 1970s lobby of my aunt's apartment building. The walls were covered in mirrors. Upstairs, we found my grandmother, my aunt's sons, one of whom had a lazy eye, her husband, and three cousins from Norway, daughters of Yasmin. Two of them were twins. Phony hugs and, and kisses were exchanged. Off in a corner was Abian. She acted like nothing happened. I hated her so much. My first summer in Toronto was sweltering. The Petro Canada at Sentinel Road and Finch Avenue West showed gas was going for 48 cents a liter, an astoundingly low price compared to the cost of fuel in Europe. Milk came in plastic bags, and the aisles of grocery stores had melted cheese in jars. Everyone drove a huge car, and my hay fever made the experience unbearable. I spent a lot of time indoors and was in awe, and was in awe of air conditioning, a North American comfort. My aunt had two microwaves. In the Netherlands, we used a conventional oven to reheat food. Every corner had a pizza shop or a convenience store. No one stopped me from looking at dirty magazines. Are you going to buy that? High rises dotted the landscape in what was known as the Jane and Finch area. This area, if Toronto news outlets were to be believed, stretched from Jane Street and Steeles Avenue West across to York University. It went as far south as Shepherd Avenue West. If you walked it, you realized that you realize Jane and Finch isn't one homogenous neighborhood suggesting it was, reflected a view that when people of color co-inhabited a part of town, they were a mass, much like, the, much like the way of referring to Africa as a whole, instead of its separate countries, is an infelicity. The area suffered from the usual social ills associated with diverse and poor neighborhoods. Every news outlet in the city identified one scourge or another. Shooting at Jane and Finch building, baby falls from balcony, birthday party ends in stabbing. The constant loop of bad news lost all meaning to me. The media kept sensationalizing and dissecting every act of violence that occurred in Jane and Finch. My stepmother encouraged us to avoid those black people. I looked at her and wondered which people, the people who lived the best way they could, despite the constant glare of police surveillance, the people who became my friends and classmates. What about them was so bad that I had to avoid them like the plague? And when did we stop being black? You see, they are not like us. They send their kids out on the street to be gangsters. Look at what's all over the news. The media fed into, the, the media fed into this paranoia about the fear of darkness that Samira 
as a Somali woman always had. My stepmother was the kind of woman who abhorred darkness. She straightened her hair and bleached her skin with an assortment of creams from Asia. The fear of, the fear of darkness in Somali culture had many sources, both native and foreign. Its odious effects drove a wedge between those born or raised in Western cities with large populations of Black Americans, Caribbeans, or Africans, and the elders in our community. Somali youth aligned themselves culturally and politically with established Black or African communities. Proud Somali parents, including my own, saw this as a corruption of our Islamic values and long-held traditions. Suddenly, everything from opposing vaginal cutting to juvenile mischief was seen as an effort to corrupt our youth and the scapegoat, as per usual, were other Black or African people. The older members of the diaspora saw no value in the cultural output of Black people in the Americas. They saw misguidance in their children resisting colonial relationships. We had to do well in school so that someday we could return to Somalia to rebuild. In essence, we forewent any sense of self in our new homes so that we might go back and fix a country they fucked up in the first place. I wanted to explore the neighborhood alone, but was stopped by my aunt. If you need to go somewhere, I will drive you. The furthest I went was to, was to Fountainhead, the giant park in front of our complex. I'm not sure if the park's planner hated humanity or loved Ayn Rand or both. Groups of brown kids played cricket. Somali mothers watched their kids dangling from the monkey bars and judged uncovered Somali girls on their way to Yorkdale Mall. I came across a public pool where children splashed each other. Overseeing the hectic joy was always a tanned white boy or girl wearing red shorts and a tank top. I stood by the fence and took deep breaths of the chlorinated air. I decided against joining them. I didn't know how to have healthy fun. Thank you, Mo. Mm. Thanks a lot. There's, wow, there's a lot in, in what you've just read. I, I want to welcome Lance McCready to our conversation. Uh, you have several of us on, on on this program are familiar with the landscape you just described, York University and North York. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why, why, why did you choose uh, those sections to, to share with us at the beginning um, of your book? When I, when I moved here, I moved here, Dutch cities are very compact. There's only so much space. Mm -hmm. And so when I landed in, uh, in North York and Jane and Finch specifically, I was amazed by how wide Finch Avenue West was. It was almost the size of a highway. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the lack of foot traffic, mm -hmm. you know, like you can walk from Peel all, all the way to Jane along Finch and encounter just a handful of people on the sidewalk. And um, it just, it was mesmerizing, you know, seeing these high rises, the traffic, the lack of foot traffic. And um, I, the contrast, like, was impressive to me. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, I, I, I hadn't lived in an overwhelmingly Black neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, the whole time my family lived in the West. So this was also a new thing to me. Mm -hmm. And seeing... Um, not just like the only other black people I've been familiar with in Europe were either from Suriname or the Dutch Antilles, mm -hmm. or they were Somali refugees like myself. And so coming here and seeing like a variety of black people from the what you know from the Caribbean or from South America or from West Africa and and Somalia included was um and of course, you know, Afro-Canadians. Um was um was a whole new world to me and i didn't quite know what to make of it and i felt like the only way i could resolve the tension is by putting pen to paper and going back to what that young man experienced mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thanks any 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 questions from for for mo from what he read just now you're muted. So 
Thanks, Lance. Courtney, jump in and I can jump in after you. <laughs> so I, I, you know, the last sentence that you talked about the young man putting pen to paper, would that be your, your answer for the question as to why write a memoir? What, what motivated you? What, what prompted you um, to, to write a memoir? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I never thought of my own life as particularly interesting. It was just, mm -hmm. it was my life. It's what I had to go through every day living in Toronto. And um, it really wasn't until I encountered um, the publisher at the University of Regina Press, because my interests had always been in, in fiction. Um, mm -hmm. Real life just seemed to, I don't know, pedestrian to me. I was mm. just like, okay, like why write about the experiences that I've encountered when I can make up these different worlds and these different characters? And um, and he just was like, um, oh, yours is a voice that needs to be heard. And um, I wasn't sure how to take that at first. I thought, at first I thought, okay, either he's being patronizing or he's just joking or maybe there's something there. And um, so I just decided to give it a go. And uh, what came out astonished me because there were so many things that I had thought about but never really shared with other people that suddenly came pouring out, you know? Um, because once I graduated high school, um, that like I didn't go back to Jane and Finch. So it had mm -hmm. been like, you know, well over 15 years since I'd even really thought about Jane and Finch and the people I was around, you know, they were all from the old city of Toronto. So most of them couldn't really relate to my experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, to them, like Jane and Finch was like an, an abstraction. It was something that they found on a map or that they heard in the news. And so for me to give it a sense of life, I think this was probably the first time that I could do it. And it felt honest, you know, mm -hmm. at least from my perspective. I mean, if you were to ask my classmates the same questions, you might get totally different answers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and just a quick follow up. Um, so, I mean, when you read this, you know, um, Neil describes it as you open, <laughs> you opening a window mm -hmm. into, into your life, um, feeling like, you know, there's almost nothing that you, you, you didn't share. Mm -hmm. So I sort of wonder, first of all, were there things that you withheld? <laughs> and, um, and the other piece would be, um, I had the experience once of, of writing a poem. And, you know, through a creative writing program, um, they encourage you to write what you know. So, of course, you start with, with biography. So I wrote this poem about this incident that happened in, my, in childhood with a family member um, that I had not shared with any other family members. And you know, wrote it and performed it in the class and it ended up being published. And I remember being very proudly sharing a copy of the anthology in which it was published with my brother. And then sort of freaking out afterwards thinking, oh my God, <laughs> I had written this poem about this thing that happened, but had not done anything to kind of disguise, you know, who the people were involved in this, in this incident. Um, so the question is, you know, did you, if, if anything, did you leave anything out? And, you know, I know you changed some, some names, mm -hmm. but, you know, you're writing about your family. Has your family, anybody in your family read the, 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 the book? And if so, what kind of feedback did you get? And any kind of trepidation around actually sharing this information? Um, I had a... I had, I had this attitude of, you know, I don't really, I'd become estranged from many of them. So um, to write about what I had endured with them um, didn't really seem like a betrayal to me. It was just, I was asked to hold on to secrets mm -hmm. and I was asked by people who didn't think about me. And so I didn't really feel like I owed it to them to hold back anything. The, the question of, um, you know, respecting people's experiences actually came up during the editing process where one of uh, my editors came back to me and said, you know, 
um, I'd written something about um, my youngest sister. And he said, you know, you are delving in a bit too deeply here. And it's not fair to her mm -hmm. um, to have her business out there like that. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like, we had a heated discussion because he felt on the one hand, you know, I'm allowed to say what I want to say, but on the other, um, just because I have a right to say what I want doesn't give me the right to injure other people. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I had to I had to think about that, and you know, in the end, realize that you know sometimes I may not see the other side right away, um, but um, I just I went along with his suggestion and I cut a fair bit out. Um, as for my family reading it, actually that same sister, I reached out to her um, after not speaking for many years. And uh, once she found out that I had written this book, all communication ceased. So, you know, I can only assume how she reacted to the book. Um, I've recently come into contact with my birth family and uh, several of them have read it. Um, my biological mother's sister, so my aunt, um, she, she was really moved by it. She said, you know, if we had known you were going through all these things, they live in Minnesota, by the way. So she said, uh, if, if she had known what I was going through, she would have been there to help. So um, unexpected, really. Um, but there's really no part of me that regrets what's between those covers. Mm -hmm. Can I ask just a, a question related to that? Mm -hmm. Well, what, how do you understand writing that might cause personal injury? Um, you know, there's like, I think that whole idea of something being libelous and um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to feel like I was being held back. And, um, and so for me, injury was just part of the game. And um, if that meant that I was bringing um, someone's reputation or experiences into the public realm, that was just something that that person had to endure. Um, but after the conversation that I had with my editor, he, he put it in this way. I don't quite know how to describe it because the way he put it was, you know, writing doesn't necessarily give me the right to divulge everything. And I was always a fan of writers who, you know, who lost friends because they fictionalized an affair that a friend of theirs had, and, you know, they had it out and like a living room or something and somebody got boxed in the face. Like I always thought that was exciting. I was like, oh, that's the type of writer that I want to be. I want to tell everyone's secrets. And, um, you know, and though, and I have to just remember that my actions have real life consequences for people because if I had kept some of those details in there, um, people who know me personally could easily figure out regardless of the, you know, the, the changes of the names could easily figure out that that's my sister. And perhaps if they still know her, could I go up to her and say, oh, I didn't know this about you. I didn't, you never told me this. Like, what is this all about? And it could really bring her back to a place where, you know, she could devolve and it could really just take mm -hmm. her life off a of track um, all in service of, you know, Muhammad wants to have a moment. Muhammad wants to have a bit of shine you know, a bit of notoriety. And so sometimes I have to find a place of balance and say, is the notoriety that I seek worth destroying someone else's peace? That's deep. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for, uh, for, um, following up on the, uh, this line of questions, these line of questions, because uh, I've known through, um, throughout what moved me about your memoir is your willingness to quote unquote, share the family's quote unquote, dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. And I know that, and that is like a constant kind of struggle for black authors in particular mm -hmm. that kind of ties into 
uh, what we were discussing, like what we were discussing earlier, this question of, around, well, what if uh, the writing is also about healing? Mm -hmm. And so kind of flip, like flipping this conversation to the other side of the coin where it's like, because obviously what you're, what you're doing in the memoir is also an ex using writing as an exercise of healing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, especially if you're writing about trauma, uh, because I myself am like working through how I'm going to use writing as an avenue to tell certain things about my family at a certain point in time mm -hmm. uh, and thinking, okay, do I wait till this person's dead or like, do I do it when I'm alive, like when they're alive, like, like legit actual concerns in terms of like, can, you know, how much is a person's reputation worth in comparison to your own pursuit to heal, to make the truth known? Because uh, as you said, like uh, at the, very, uh, at the very, uh, very beginning, you've been asked to hold on these secrets and that in of itself is a violence. And so I'm wondering if we could kind of talk about the ways in which the book was also a healing process for you. Because mm -hmm. it literally ends with you coming to this like profound breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, um, every time I would sit down to write and that evening I would drink and drug. So it was definitely, Initially, I saw it just as an exercise of like, oh, I'm going to get back at all the people that, you know, ever did me any wrong. And it turned out that, um, you know, I was, I was drinking a poison I'd intended for others, you know, mm. and um, I just had to realize, okay, am I, am I going to write this? Yes. Am I going to write this with a knife in my hand and a pen in the other? Maybe. Um, and so the effects of that I'm still going through um, because the way I grew up, you know, joking somebody was like a great way to get back at them, you know, but you could also joke somebody with your tongue. It wasn't, you know, and so I just, I'm not, a, I'm not per se like a violent person, but I've come to see that um, the things I put out in the world will come back to me, um, not necessarily like the way I put them out, but there will be questions about why I chose to say it in this particular way, um, why I chose to, like you said, air a particular person's like dirty laundry, and I just have to answer for that. Um, I think the difference today is that um, I have to also just own the things I do. So not to feel a sense of shame about my own process or how I chose to go about it. If mm -hmm. other people are, you know, see what I did as shameful and, you know, like in Somali culture, we have this concept of, uh, it's not quite honor, but it's also not quite pride. It's the term for it is shut off. So shut off could be like, Shut off could be like, you know, covering yourself appropriately, but it's also holding back on saying particular things and maybe using like euphemisms to describe them. Mm -hmm. And by doing away with that, in a way, like culturally, I'm exposing myself. So even people who agree with the fact that like I chose to tell my story may still look at me and say, well, you're you're revealing your own morality. You know, yes, you've told these people stories, but you're also leaving yourself uncovered. Like you're saying a lot more about yourself mm -hmm. than you are about these other people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a murky terrain. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the good thing is I'm not afraid of getting dirty, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Clearly not. <laughs> So, but the mother follow up on that. So, did you see this writing as a form of healing? Is that the proper term, even? Yeah. Uh, um, I wouldn't per se say healing. Um, yeah. I saw it more as like a, as a professional opportunity. You know, oh. not to be crass, not to be crass about things, but for me all of the writing I had been doing up to that point had been 
reject it. You know, I would mm. submit work to publications, large and small. And oftentimes the response would be, you know, your writing doesn't quite fit in with, you know, that standard cold response that one would get. And, um, and here I was, and it was like, oh, just tell us how you've gone through life and we'll put it between covers. And I thought, mm -hmm. great, wow. you know, how could, how could I do this? And the result really was a lot more painful than what I had bargained for. So initially it was mm -hmm. a self-serving project and it turned mm -hmm. out that like, I was able to see parts of myself that I didn't particularly care to look at. Um, one thing that really struck me was, um, you know, when I decided to do that, what I like to refer to as the pilgrimage. So to revisit five sites in Toronto where I grew up. And, um, and it was at Weston and Lawrence where I was sitting and I was overlooking this park that I passed many, many times and just was a park. But in that moment, it became like, I literally felt something just crawling out of me. And, you know, so this professional opportunity really turned into this sort of like psychic transformation which really brought me closer to doing away with you know the life I was leading which was fueled by drugs and alcohol and like lasciviousness hmm. wow. you know one of the um I mean there was so much in the book that I guess resonated with me um and probably like a lot of other um sissy boys as I like to to call us um you know gender non-conforming who, you know, as children were, you know, identified before we even had any sense of our own identities mm -hmm. as being different. And then, the, you know, we needed a particular kind of treatment as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and finding, you know, as a, as a child, but also as a young adult and an adult, mm -hmm. um, a certain kind of safety mm -hmm. among women and girls. Um, so I think one of the, the, the pieces um, in, in, I was going to say the novel, I've mm -hmm. <laughs> been doing novels, in, in your memoir mm -hmm. was really around the role of women mm -hmm. and, uh, and the sort of the, the various poles that were kind of depicted mm -hmm. from women uh, or girls as, as being tormentors, um, sources of, of, of violence, mm -hmm. um, physical and otherwise, and then women, you give the shout out to um, the Caribbean girls in, in high school or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, His crew. <laughs> who, were your, who were your protectors, mm -hmm. um, who affirmed you and supported you and protected you. So is there a question in that? Maybe just, I think, talk a bit about, about the presence of, of women and girls in, in, in this piece of writing mm -hmm. and in your life? Um, yeah, my, my, my life was um, populated by women by and large. I mean, men played, um, you know, women played an outsized role. I think as a result of historical circumstance, you know, when you look at a lot of families who fled Somalia to come to the West, it is oftentimes the mothers and sisters that have to kick it into high gear. And mm -hmm. the men are sort of, you know, they too can sometimes like pick up and continue, but uh, there are a lot of them who are just burdened by the loss of home and then being marginalized here. Mm -hmm. And um, what I saw in the women around me was that, um, their pain, they kept, by and large, they kept private, you know, so you couldn't really tell that they were going through it by just looking at them. Um, that's what I got to see um, behind closed doors. So I got to see like, you know, the displays of violence, the rage and the anger, but outside it was very much just like, you know, cover up, go to school, um, get this job, you know, find out what kind of money you qualify for, making sure that, you know, you get your name on this housing list and making sure the kids go to the right school and make sure they do their homework and, and not allow anything that, that I do reflect badly on that. 
So there was, um, make sure you do well in school, Muhammad. Make sure you don't fail this test. Make sure you learn the language. Do better than the kids who are born here. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, endure the pain and the struggle that shows itself behind closed doors. So um, it was hard to live up to that expectation of like, wanting to be a good son. And I think naturally, because I have like a, a, a submissive side to myself that um, forces me to uh, be agreeable, regardless of like how painful that may be. And so, yeah, I did speak Dutch better than the Dutch kids. I did try my best in school and I tried not to shame my mother in the street. And then I had to, I had to reconcile that to the fact that she was clearly, clearly not well. She was mm -hmm. someone who was, who had to endure a lot. And, and, um, and there were a lot of expectations of her as well. You know, the calls that she would get in the middle of the night from family members pleading for money or pleading for some kind of support. Mm -hmm. And people didn't get to see that, you know, and, um, she just wanted to show her strong side. And that's the one thing that I've realized about uh, black women in general was um, they're forced to put on that armor every time they go on, go into the public street. And, um, and the comforting thing for me was that when I came to Toronto um, and I encountered these, these daughters of Caribbean immigrants was that they let part of that armor, you know, fall by the wayside when they were around me. So I got to see how they dealt with the cat calling, for example, in Jane Finch Mall. But then when we were sitting together between the buildings and they were telling me about intimate parts of their life, I got to see that contrast in the same way that I saw that contrast in my mother and my sisters. And so it just allowed me to, you know, to be a much more complicated person than I cared to be um, <laughs> because I realized that the women that held me up or that held me, that kept me down were also complicated people. And mm. I really just wanted this, I don't know, I wanted a cookie cutter, you know, TV sitcom, this sort of deracinated life for myself and um, they were not making it easy, so. I'm, I'm thinking about your, your first love, Yusuf. Uh, the, the, the fact that at age nine, while you were being taunted, being called a, a ballet girl, that you were in love with, with Yusuf. And later in your life, when you made the trek to the UK, that you went in search of Yusuf. What was it about Yusuf that, that made you love him so much? Um, he, his mother cautioned him the same way, mm -hmm. you know, don't shame me, don't do this, don't do that. Mm -hmm. And he didn't listen. He did as he pleased. And that was such a thrill, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, we'd walk into a store together and he'd walk out with a bunch of things he didn't pay for. And I was like, oh, you're not supposed to do that. And then I just, I felt this excitement and, um, and it really colored the type of men I would gravitate toward in, you know, my liberated adult life. Mm -hmm. um, but there was the fact that he did not live within the within the constraints of like Somali respectability or, you know, that notion that children of refugees have that as long as I just continue doing the right thing, my parents will love me. And it's not about being loved for just being Muhammad. It was like, I had to do the thing in order to get the love. And he didn't care if he got loved. He was just like, I'm going to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And if you want to join me for the ride, feel free. If not, I'm still going to do it anyway. You know, that sort of um, recklessness that, um, you know, that I avoided 
and he just he gave it he gave it life and it also it helped that he was like a he was a good looking boy so it was like oh he's not only like wild and crazy it's like he's nice to look at so it just like and I was just curious about those things you know I, and I've watched and I'd watch TV and it was always like, I was always rooting for the bad guy. And finally mm. there was a version of that in my life. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So I just, I, I really adored him. Um, looking back on it now, that sort of antisocial behavior, which really wasn't checked by anybody, mm -hmm. didn't bode well for him. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, when you read earlier, about your stepmother saying not to, 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 that you're to avoid those black people. I'm just thinking in terms of what Yusuf represented in terms of the restless, the, the re restlessness is, is in, 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 I'm thinking about these black people, those black people that your, your stepmother said that you're, you're to avoid. Um, and 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 you're right in the heart of where there are, are are many of them. How how did you reconcile that? Her her advice and you developing friendships. Um, the kids who were cool and who were doing bad things. Mm -hmm. A, because I was such a sissy, they didn't want to be around me anyway. And the fact mm -hmm. that I was so eager to just be a goody two-shoes, that also didn't appeal. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it just naturally pushed me to the girls who were going to do well, mm -hmm. but who are also street smart. And um, so I was still getting called names in school. Um, the only difference was, you know, the, the type of, the type of homophobia that I faced at Jane and Finch, it wasn't physically violent at all. It was just verbal. It was like, you know, the things that they might hear at home or in church or in dance hall songs. It was, it was like that, you know, it was just like this term and that term. And so that's, it, it didn't injure me, you know? And so I felt like, oh, I could be in class with this kid who's got the cornrows and plays on the basketball team, but I would never really fix my face to go up to him and say like, oh, hey, do you want to hang out? Because I knew that in his world and the way he conducted himself, um, I, was, I was not a good look. And um, so the, the, uh, the young ladies who took me in and who befriended me, um, they didn't care about the things that made me uncool. To them, um, the way I was was just fine. And um, what really helped was that, again, those distances in Jane and Finch, that I could be in one part and my mom has no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, there were exceptions to that, though. There would be times when I'd be going through, like, your gate mall or Jane and Finch mall, and I would get home and my mom would say, oh, who are those girls that you were with? And I think to myself, I didn't see you. Like, how did you know that I was with my friends? And she would say, oh, so-and-so called me. She saw you. She saw you with those girls. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. And I would just tell her, you know, like, okay, fine. Like, I won't do it. Um, and one thing is that, you know, in an abusive environment, you learn to lie. Mm -hmm. And so... When it, for example, like when it was time for Ramadan, um, those same friends, I'd go to McDonald's and eat hamburgers with them, you know, and they knew to keep that secret because, you know, I went to school and my sisters were in the same school and my brother at one point was a student there. So um, we just had each other's back and it just made me realize that, you know, just because you're related to somebody um, doesn't necessarily mean that they... Um, that your safety or your um, sense of personhood is like at the forefront of their minds. Mm -hmm. And these young ladies showed me that I can get to know strangers and they could really love me in a way that my family just wasn't able or willing to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, 
they really, they, yeah, they just sort of showed me that what my mom was saying about um, the daughters and the sons of like Caribbean or West African immigrants just wasn't true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, I, can I ask a follow-up question? This is just sort of, I don't know, an opinion or wondering what you think, because we know uh, that a lot of um, Black people who arrived to Canada, you know, uh, that didn't grow up here as refugees or sometimes as immigrants don't necessarily identify as Black when they're here, right? And there's almost a saying where you, sometimes the longer you're in Canada, you become Black, but you don't, you don't arrive like necessarily identifying as black, mm -hmm. right? Um, do you think as educators or as even group um, like BGMN, do you think that we should intervene about that? Or is that something that you agree just should unfold the way it unfolds? In other words, should we be encouraging people to identify as Black? Should we encourage young people to identify as Black? Does that just unfold based on sort of what you've experienced in your life? Because I think that that's something that often gets talked about. <laughs> Why doesn't that person identify as Black? Or they should identify this way. And they know that they're Black, so why aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> like coming over here, but I'm just curious because you really sort of lay that out and talk about that pretty clearly. Something that I think sometimes is mentioned, but not always we don't get to witness or describe it as clearly as you do. So I'm just curious about what you think about that. Mm -hmm. um, now that I've had a chance to, you know, to think about that question, um, I've come to realize like for somebody like my stepmother growing up in East Africa, you know, everyone around her would have been black. So there's no, mm -hmm. there's no need to say, oh, I'm a black woman because for her, it's just, it's part of her everyday life. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so when she, when she brought us here, um, I felt like to her, it was like yet, an, yet another thing that she had to accept or to work through. And so um, it was just, it was something that she, like, she just gave it little importance. Mm -hmm. And, um, but she knew just from being from East Africa and, you know, like the history of Somalia involves like fascist, like uh, race laws, you know? And um, so she's aware of how Westerners view us. That wasn't something that was entirely alien to her. She like had a pretty clear understanding that they viewed us as inferior because of the amount of melanin in our skin and the way, you know, we practice our cultures. Um, but even living in Jane and Finch, there was very little discussion of that question. Um, I remember the the idea that a lot of my classmates had of Africa was like the world vision baby, you know, this mm -hmm. emaciated child mm -hmm. with flies all over its face. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's what they knew. Or it was in the mold of like sort of, um, you know, either like Rastafarian thinking about like Africa or African figures or a, a pan-African vision of Africa as this sort of like glorious place that was, you know, severed from their ancestors. And so I arrive into this place with um, the burdens of my own family's historical experiencing experiences and coming up against all of the experiences of my classmates. And, the, and I think there is, so much tension in that question that it was just easier for us to not even engage in it. You know, we already had so much to think about that it was like, you know what, we're good with each other. I see you, you see me. So let's just leave it at that. Um, but today I realized that is that it's a question that needs addressing. And um, the more people are able to speak to it, whether, you know, 
as an organization, you create space for people to have that dialogue. It's, it's important. And I don't think, I don't think that my experience um, is necessarily a helpful one even because I had to go into libraries and make it a point of figuring out what the source of my discomfort was. Mm -hmm. And I think when you can discuss that discomfort in the company of others who have those same pressing questions, there is something liberating about that and something comforting about that. Um, so the, the more room there is to talk about these things, the better. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, I guess I wanted to kind of add to, uh, add, to, uh, add to this question because in your memoir, I mean, you document the various ways in which you're becoming black more than once, mm -hmm. in a sense. Uh, how did your experience in the Netherlands differ or contrast the ways in which uh, you experience Canada upon arrival? Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I arrived in the Netherlands, um, we were immediately placed in this. Um, so the Netherlands has, you know, Canada has this uh, social policy of multiculturalism. And in Holland, they had, on paper, they had multiculturalism. In practice, it was more like assimilation. Mm -hmm. And so it was really about shedding um, my Africanness and about becoming Dutch. And what I saw um, was that there was very little discussion about their own role as colonizers of mm -hmm. Black people. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the Dutch didn't talk about the Holocaust. They didn't talk about um, enslaving Africans. They didn't talk mm. about colonizing Indonesia and committing countless massacres there. Um, they were only willing to talk about their accomplishments as a small European country. Mm. And th their intention was for me to, uh, to internalize that and to make those accomplishments my own, but then also to take um, my African self and just leave it at the door, you know, to walk around in Rotterdam or Amsterdam, you know, visually as an African person, but internally, you know, everything is Dutch. Mm -hmm. And um, what I realized was that I, I was like, it was, I was misled, you know, when I came here, I felt like somebody had, i I'd been scammed in some way mm -hmm. because when I moved here, I was told like, oh, um, these things that you believe about yourself are not true, mm -hmm. you know? And um, there is nothing wrong with being Somali. There's nothing wrong with being black and there is no reason for you to shed that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm being told this after I spent countless years trying to be Dutch. All of a sudden now I'm being told that it's okay to be black, it's okay to be Somali. And, um, and not only that, but to have pride in it, you know? So it was like a twofold thing. And so I had to reconstitute myself. Mm -hmm. And um, one way I was able to do that was not only uh, by befriending the daughters of, of West Indian immigrants, but also to seek out works in the library that gave, um, that gave shape to what it means to be Black in the Americas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, love, I love the fact that uh, you discovered Richard Wright. Well, not necessarily why you discovered Richard Wright, but, but, but that, that class assignment that everybody's given, and then the teacher hands out sugar cane, and, uh, and, 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 and you, you go in search of black authors and, 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 and you found Richard Wright. What, what were you feeling in that moment when the teacher did that? Um, first she had given us, so she gave us the sugar cane and it was, um, I was like, oh, I've had this before. I've had this before. I couldn't remember when, because mm -hmm. it wasn't, we didn't really have sugar cane at home. So mm -hmm. for me, it unlocked, something that I couldn't quite place my finger on. It was like, 
Um, and secondly, the way this, you know, she then proceeded to read us a short story that was set in Barbados in um, the 1940s and uh, described seeing these British um, jet, you know, I don't know what they were called back then, but they were fighter planes and they were putting down a rebellion in mm -hmm. Barbados. Mm -hmm. and, um, and up to that point, my, uh, the purpose of my life was to be agreeable to white people. Mm -hmm. And so to hear um, these Bayesians, you know, rising up against the British and being like, you know, we are going to forge our own way forward. I thought, well, there must surely be more of this then. Mm -hmm. Because I, I was, I was, I had so much discomfort around, I just felt like a fake, you know, mm -hmm. here I was moving through the world, um, you know, going over to my friends' homes and watching Pasa Pasa videos and be like, hey, oh my God, look at that, look at this, look at that, you know, and then inside I'm just like, oh God, I don't know how to be this person. I just, mm -hmm. I know how to put it on, but I didn't feel authentic. Mm -hmm. And so coming, uh, going to Yorkwood's library, fantastic library, by the way, mm -hmm. um, and encountering Richard Wright was like, that was like a sigh of relief. It's like, oh, here's someone who will help me make sense of who I am in the place where I am. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was just the beginning of a journey that I'm still on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyone else for questions? Let me, let me remind the audience that you can ask us, you can ask questions by using the chat to, to do so. And we will, we will share those, those questions with, with Mo. Um, I guess, speaking of, I guess we were talking earlier about the, the black body, um, <laughs> the chapters where you start talking about your exploration of, you know, being sexually active Mm -hmm. So whether it's on the chat lines and having hookups and looking at porn, um, you know, I guess talk about your experiences or your understanding of, of how um, within, I guess, gay male um, popular culture and, and, and um, um, the black body has been positioned. Um, yeah, because you, you talk about, you know, having to navigate this notion of, of who you are, particularly to, to white men, how they, you know, what they see in you or what they project onto you versus who you were and what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, for, I mean, many of us have that experience and you write about it in, in the memoirs. So could you talk a bit about it with us today? Uh, yeah, I... Um... So before I had intimate encounters, my, you know, I would, um, I came of age when like broadband was, a, became a commonplace thing. So using the family computer to find like, you know, homo thug porn was, was, was eye opening because it was all of a sudden like, you know, the boys that I would see um, on the Jane bus or, you know, just walking around the neighborhood with their clothes off, you know, it was like, oh, wow, this is great. This is wonderful. And it really, um, it elaborated the desires that I had when I met Yusuf and, um, and what reality really presented me with was that um, I wasn't the type they were looking for. So that was a real letdown, you know, um, I remember like one of the sites that I would use a lot, um, the profiles would say, uh, if you don't have any bass in your voice, don't bother messaging me. And I'm like, oh my God, people mistake me for a girl all the time on the phone. This guy is like, this is not, not going to want me. So. You know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and what I encountered instead was um, the white queens, they just, they saw they didn't see Muhammad they just saw blackness and so they they saw in me an avenue to their own climax and I was so 
hungry for intimate physical encounters that I, I just agreed with whatever they wanted to do with my body. And I was willing to um, play whatever role they cast me in. Um, and, um, but I still, I still longed for um, my personal ideal of a Black lover. Um, it's just that I wasn't brave enough to step up to a man and say like, hey, my name is, I think you're beautiful. Um, because that has its own dangers, you know? And, um, and I just thought it easier if I just go, you know, when I have that intense moment um, to just go to these queens who, you know, who are willing to just open their door and say like, okay, now put on a show for me. You know, I wasn't brave enough to open my mouth to my brethren. Instead, I was willing to just lay there and be an object, you know, for someone else's twisted desires because it was just easier to go that way. Mm -hmm. So but is there a follow-up Courtney or Lance or Chris? <laughs> Courtney, Courtney was like. <laughs> you know, I, I was like, okay, you know, maybe I should just stick to the, stick to the memoir. <laughs> I guess my, my, my follow-up question would be, you know, because that's a place where, where many of us start in terms of that kind of journey, um, sort of acting out other, you know, fantasies are projected onto our, to us, to us. Mm -hmm. and then the, 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 I guess the journey to find, to identify our own source of pleasure, our own way of being, being mm -hmm. sexual, um, in ways that aren't about, unless you want it to be domination, right? Um, so where are you now on that journey? Um... To be honest, I've been celibate for the last three years, so I haven't really engaged other men in any sexual act. I think it's because I am wanting to see who I am honestly, mm -hmm. and I think that requires stepping back from um, my carnal desires and to, and to say, what do I want out of this life? I'm only given this one go around. And um, for me to spend it as um, an object for other people's twisted desires just doesn't make sense to me anymore. And so if that means I have to take a little break and assess what I really want and to figure out what that looks like um, and where, where some of these uh, behaviors come from, that willingness to just be an object for someone else's desire, like where does that really come from? You know, because I think I disguised it for a long time as the seeking of beauty and pleasure, you know, something beautiful to look at while, you know, taking, you know, copious amounts of, of drugs or drinking a lot in order mm. to sort of feel, you know, like, to feel something. And so today I don't have to run to those things anymore. And instead I can just sit still and be with myself and to say, you know, Mohammed, like, what do you really want? Mm -hmm. Who is it that really gives you that tingle? And not just what do they look like, but what are the traits that they have? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like, um, I was just on the phone uh, less than an hour ago with a friend of mine, and uh, he was uh, recounting a story to me. And he's like, girl, can you believe this man's car broke down? And his boyfriend just went out and bought him a new car. And we just had a good laugh about it because we were both like, you know what? That's a good quality. You know, something goes wrong in my life. <laughs> you know, to have my man be like, oh, you know what? Here's a brand new version of it. Like, you know what? Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I kind of a, a follow up to the uh, a follow up to the follow up uh, because uh, one of the uh, one of the things that's uh, come up for me in this conversation uh, and obviously the three uh, the three the three of us Mo 
Courtney and myself, you know, immediately we're just like, yes, you know, we know what it's like to be the sissy boy. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about how the closeness of your friendship with your crew shaped whether we might want to call it a femme identity or an embracing of your sissiness and owning it and claiming it and finding it a source of empowerment rather than as a diss. And how does this then also shape the ways in which then and now you're navigating the realm of sexuality? Mm -hmm. um, what, what they taught me was that, you know, you, I can look very, um, I can look very extravagant and um and have and still have that fire in me you know what i mean and um that those two things don't need to be at odds with one another so i can go out in the world wearing a whole bunch of colors have my hair in a fro you know wear different kinds of glasses and you know have a purse and still tell you about yourself and not really businessing about what you think of me, you know? So that being effeminate or being a sissy is not necessarily being meek, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas I always thought of it that way. It was like, oh, um, I just have to take the abuse that comes my way, you mm -hmm. know? Because there's no other way to get through the world. And they were like, oh, no, 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 you don't need to do that. You can, you can have a comeback. And mm -hmm. if it comes to it, you might have to take a weapon to somebody. Mm. That's just, that is the only recourse. And so I was like, oh, that's possible. Okay, I'm going to try that. Of course, thankfully, I haven't had to take a weapon to anybody else's head or body. But, you know, I've been able to say things in response to abuse, you know? Mm -hmm. Of course, here, here you are in, in a situation where you're grappling with your Somali tradition, you're grappling with Western culture, and then September 11, 2001, 9-11 happened, and you have this, this whole experience, which eventually leads to you moving from Muhammad to, to Mo. And I'm wondering if you can tell tell me a bit about what tell us a bit about what, how how that affected your your relationship to to Islam and and being Muslim. Um, my family um, they were devout. They are devout. Mm -hmm. um, I should stop speaking about them in the past tense. Um, they are devout people. Um, and even before 9-11, we saw that uh, we lived in a place that was hostile to Islam. Mm. And um, when I was about 11 or 12, no, younger than that, actually, maybe about nine, my sisters um, in Holland had gone to school with their hijabs on and were sent back home mm -hmm. and were told that until they returned to school without their hijab, they were not allowed to come back. And, um, and so that was my very first, like, experience seeing that, you know, shedding that part of myself was also um, important. So it wasn't just like having to, um, to stop being Somali, but that like, doing away with Islam was also important in order to fit into Dutch society. Mm -hmm. And um, when we moved here, we had about a year where, you know, Islam really wasn't thought of much in North America. It was just like, oh, Islam, yes, it's just another religion. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't really stand out. Mm -hmm. um, I think the bigger problem, especially like for a lot of people with the election of George W. Bush was actually like these evangelical Christians. That's who people in that moment were really afraid of. You mm -hmm. know, it was like, oh my God, they're going to ban abortion. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And um, so 9-11 really put the spotlight on us. Mm -hmm. And um, there, was, there was a moment when I thought to myself, you know what, this is a get out of jail free card for me. Mm -hmm. 
nobody's going to look at me cross if I just decide, you know, to slowly retreat from Islam. And there were really, there were no repercussions, you know, trying, going from Muhammad to Mo was just, a, was just a first stage for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it continued on. It, it, it um, for me, eating pork was another way of rebelling. It was like, oh, nobody's really going to, if anything, I think friends of mine would, would ask like, oh, you know, is it okay if my family serves pork? And I would say, yeah, no, that's great. I eat it. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> is it okay if, um, you know, I remember going to a family, uh, a friend's uh, family's, I forget if it was a Seder or if it was another type of uh, high holiday. Anyway, so I think it was like Rosh Hashanah or something. And um, so my friend was reading a prayer and she just couldn't get the prayer out. And so she just handed me the card the prayer was written on. And her mother, who's Jewish, but her father wasn't, um, was horrified because she's like, no, 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 Muhammad, you don't have to read this. I said, no, I'm going to read it. I am. And so I read it and she was really concerned because she was like, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. What would your mother think if you're over at our house and you're reciting Jewish prayers? And I thought, no, this is just another notch on my belt, you know, mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. journey of like waywardness. It was just like, F you, F the faith. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the deeper I just sort of, the deeper I went, the more I realized there were so many parts of my life that were governed by Islamic morality. Mm -hmm. that ditching it by the time I decided that I was going to be a public, like publicly homosexual, mm -hmm. it was like, it had been like, my connection had been so degraded mm -hmm. that it was easy. And again, nobody was going to fault me because I could just say, well, there is, there is no reconciling being gay and Muslim. There's mm -hmm. no reconciling living in a Western city and being Muslim. Mm -hmm. So, um, I never, I never got any pushback mm -hmm. and, um, what I've come to realize is that, um, I was doing myself a disservice, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, the best, the best type of thinking comes from tension and comes from conflict. Mm -hmm. And so instead of embracing that conflict and that tension, I was just trying to find an easy way out. Mm -hmm. So. You know, today, you know, when I pray to God, I say, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I also say, like, you know, dearest Lord. So for me, it's God can exist in every tongue possible. Mm -hmm. And um, so is it a real? You just froze there. Sorry, I, mm -hmm. I just got a call. I don't know what you heard or didn't hear. Uh, you cut out a, is it a? Oh, yeah. For me, I, I can't say it's like a, a return to Islam. It's more of um, accepting that I have a different way to God than my fellow Muslims. And that's all right, you know, Islam isn't a uniform thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's really just about the acceptance that there's only one God and that Muhammad is his prophet. So, and I co-sign that, like I'm okay with that today, you know? Mm -hmm. All the other stuff that exists in tension with each other, you know, I'm not a theologian, so I can't really speculate on like what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do know is that, you know, God has spared me like, many years of turmoil and heartache and potential death so i just have to exist in a place of gratitude you know for okay. his favor thanks lance okay. oh courtney no go ahead lance. okay i actually if it'd be okay courtney because i actually finally can articulate some of my thoughts related to our previous conversation about like porn and the body and identity and i wanted to like come back to that if we could at a point go ahead only because and i'm going to talk about 
speak about this a little bit also as a researcher too, uh, because uh, maybe Courtney, maybe Chris, maybe all of us know about, I think just a lot of young people today, their sexuality <laughs> education is through porn. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. they come to understand sometimes their and not just young people, but many of us black gay men too. <laughs> black gay men too. It's like um, we understand our desires, or sometimes what we like or what we don't like, or and or you know we can in some kinds of porn we accept the way that we're objectified, and in mm -hmm. other kinds of form. The, the lack of representation of femme black gay men, even in sort of porn. So uh, if porn is a kind of sexuality education, um, do we need different kinds of porn or do we need to stop watching porn? <laughs> and move to other forms of I know that seems like a strange question because I was gonna but I was gonna say uh, I was gonna say that it's it's well I guess go but I don't I don't think it's 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 about porn because porn kind of reinforces social messages that are already there. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was that would be my first thought. Mm -hmm. Um Around, around gender roles, around masculinity, mm -hmm. and they get played out. Okay, so let in, me be in, more in specific, and, and I think this is, let me yeah. be more specific. Okay. I've taught to, it might reinforce some messages, but I've talked to some Black gay men and Black queer youth who have said like, oh, I didn't understand what I was experiencing in the predominantly white gay community till I watched porn and then I really knew how they saw me. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that then it clicked <laughs> and then, or that they didn't, they just saw me as, uh, I forgot the way you, you said it Mo, but it really, I, I like that they just, an avenue, uh, an avenue for, uh, oh gosh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I know, I know, I know, I know, I know what you guys were talking about. An avenue to their pleasure, or an avenue to uh, their twisted desires. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And so, so I don't know. So I was just wondering your thoughts on on that, and I also was really sort of uh, moved and that you, you know, you're being open. Oh, I've, you know, I've really taken some time to sort of figure this out. Like, what are my desires? Like, what do I want? I don't want to just, because I, I may be recognizing I am sort of susceptible to just sort of falling into this or adapting mm -hmm. to what is being presented to me about who I am, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, yeah, I was just wondering sort of your, Thoughts about that? Now, and actually, I don't. I'm making an assumption. I don't know if being celibate means also not looking at porn. <laughs> but, uh, I think he can clarify. It, <laughs> <laughs> it may or may not. But but I was just wondering about your thoughts about that because yeah, because there's just a lot. I have a, this conversation with my colleagues, some of whom are really invested in sex education in schools. And my often position is nobody's learning about sex from sex education in schools. They're learning it, about it from porn and all these other spaces outside of school. So can we talk about that more than we talk about this formal sex education curriculum? But anyway, yeah, I saw, I'm wondering your thoughts about that in terms of with porn and stuff. Um, yeah, like, I had, um, so I had received like sex education back in Holland and then also here in Toronto. And most of it was just based around like reproduction and what to do um, to stay safe during sex, but very little touched on desire. And um, I just knew that porn gave me like a visual language to actually say like, oh, like, 
I, I, I enjoy doing this. I enjoy doing that before I'd even done the thing. And it's only, what it, what it did for me was um, it piqued my curiosity and it allowed me to not have to feel my way in, you know, through the dark and to just say, oh, well, I'm curious about this act. So let me just go out and find someone who's willing to try it with me. And then after the fact, deciding like, oh, actually, that wasn't so much fun. I'm not, I'm not going to do that again. And then, you know, so I was able to make a list for myself based on uh, the performers in these, in these films and to say to myself, is this something that I'm willing to try? And, mm. um, and so I just went out and I, I tried it. Um, I don't, for me, I didn't feel like it, um, I don't think that it really corrupted or redirected my sexual experiences because I realized that um, I wanted to try heavy duty things anyway whether I was exposed to porn or not, I was going to try them. And, um, you know, reading the Marquis de Sade, for example, is a lot more harmful than watching a porno, in my experience, you know, because some of the things that he describes in his writing is like, oh, this is just straight up murder, you know? And, um, and so what porn really did was like, it showed me, um, it showed me like in the ways that like personalities or behaviors that I had were desirable, um, but that I could also go against that narrative. So for example, the association between like being a, uh, like an effeminate man or a sissy and then automatically assumed to be a bottom, you know, I was mm -hmm. like, ah, that doesn't really compute for me. Like, I don't really like, you know, and then I was just like, oh, there's, there's like this notion of like, um, of like transgressing that, even, you know, like being this loud queen and, you know, being agreeable in some ways, but that in the bedroom, I'm doing these like violent things. And, um, and that excited me, you know, that contrast. Mm. And I wouldn't have been able to get close to experiencing those things had I not watched porn beforehand. And, um, and then to answer your question, being celibate for me does include watching porn. So, mm -hmm. yeah. God helps those who help themselves, you know? <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a gospel house tune that I'm hearing. That's right, that's right. <laughs> well, we're... we're we're, we're, we're coming up soon to the, the end of the conversation, but, uh, but before asking Courtney, Christopher, and Lance if they have anything uh, else to, to, to ask, I, I want to, I know that you're working on something new, a book of essays. We started off this conversation in, and you mentioned that you have more of an, an interest in, in fiction than than autobiographical writing and uh, and I know that at one point you had written stories in the in the UK that got destroyed when you came back to Toronto wondering if we're ever going to see those those stories resurface and also tell us about this this book of essays that you're working on um yeah so those short stories that um, I brought over from England. I don't think I'll be rewriting them. They were really just uh, uh, a riff on like the Marquis de Sade. And I just, I felt like it was, um, it wasn't really my genuine voice. Um, and I was, I was trying too hard to be transgressive mm -hmm. instead of it feeling authentic. It was like, Oh, what could we write about? Oh, necrophilia. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty like taboo subject. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, that's just all that's really going to do is expose you as like a shock jock, you know? Mm -hmm. And is that going to last? Probably not. Um, so I want to write, I, I want to write for posterity. I want to write for future Africans who, you know, when they go into f future libraries and 
come across my dust covered work will say, oh, this is what the Somali writer in exile had to say. And he perhaps wasn't the same as Nuruddin Farah, or he wasn't the same as Chinao Achebe, or, you know, he isn't as concerned with some of the things that say like other Muslim writers or other queer writers are concerned with. Um, but here he is anyway, you know, and um, necrophilia isn't going to get me very far, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just trying to disturb people, you know, and controversy only gets you so far. So, um, and so I realized my fiction, I want to, I want to really play around with like structure. I want to play around with um, how I word things and um, how I present them to the reader and engage the reader in a way that causes them the same discomfort that I'm caused by writing these things and writing about uh, people who are between places who find themselves caught in these crevices caused by movement and like sudden expulsion or you know a sudden introduction into something unfamiliar mm -hmm. um so yeah I um you know I got myself an agent and uh she oh. pitched the book deal and um one of them is a novel that's slated to come out in 2024 uh, about a young Somali cross-dresser who um is found dead and who's also found to have kept stacks of notebooks wherein he recounts his, you know, introduction to this underground world of uh, sadomasochism and um, different types of like erotic experiences and um, his use of violence to get what he wants. And um, all the while just moving as a singular body through this metropolis that that's called Toronto. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this is completely in a whole other direction. <laughs> the one, I grew up in Scarborough, um, the early 70s to what, the mid to late 80s. And there's a line in the book where you describe Scarborough as an architectural abyss. <laughs> 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 that was one of the lines that made me laugh out loud and there was one that kept playing in my head <laughs> I would like to come back to that <laughs> <laughs> so I you know, I, you know I have roots in Scarborough so I am allowed to whatever but um so talk to us about Scarborough being an architectural abyss actually not at all um so you were you how did you so you ended up at Ryerson for um, planning, urban, was it urban design planning, um, mm -hmm. urban regional, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that line stuck out for me, that piece around, around architecture and design was something that was clearly an interest of yours, interest enough to, to actually want to go study it. So just, just a, a, a bit about, about that um, for you. What, Is there a question? <laughs> Sorry. No, I, mean, I, can, I, I can answer that. <laughs> Go um, ahead. Like, like so many of my interests, uh, my interest in, in cities really came from simulation. So, okay. um, you know, I discovered my sexual desires through simulation. And so my love of, um, of cities really came from playing this game called... Uh, Sim City, okay, where you get to design your own city, and um, and what I realized was like architecture represents the hopes and aspirations of the people I live amongst, mm. and that wasn't necessarily something I could um, gauge by staying in a simulated environment. I wasn't ever going to get that from playing Sim City. I had to find a place a physical fixed place where those topics would um would receive the attention that they deserve and so going into Ryerson I had a faint idea of like 
you know, I liked buildings, but I didn't mm -hmm. understand that like buildings really governed our conduct, that buildings were um, made in such a way that um, they kept certain people in and other people out. You know, and like the thing about Ryerson was that the entrances were kind of obscured. Like when you go throughout the campus, it's hard to see the doors sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I was, I started thinking about things like that. And I was like, oh, and when I started working for the provincial government, which is around the time I was living in Scarborough, what I started to realize in a lot of these downtown, like financial district buildings was the same thing was going on you know, like the signage for the bathroom was obscured. And I was like, why is that? And then I realized, oh, they don't really want the homeless people down here. You know, and so architecture became just another vehicle for control. Mm. And I began to understand like um, architecture in North America is not really designed with the marginal in mind. And I was already aware of my own marginal position in this society. And so architecture then became just another thing to think about, mm -hmm. you know? And the layout of the streetscape became yet another thing to think about. It's like, why is it that I live in this poor neighborhood and there are so many one-way streets? And I didn't understand that until this uh, Trinidadian professor of mine was like, you know, those things are done to limit prostitution. I was like, what? And I was like, the streetscape is designed to reinforce our morality. Like mm. these things were not, were not things that I was going to find by playing SimCity. I had to mm. sit in the classroom. I had to be pointed to titles that were going to show me why Scarborough was an architectural abyss. You know, why there was so much room and people chose to build the same strip plaza over and over and over and over again. Why there were so many parking lots. You know, why the car crash excited me. You know, I only found that out in Scarborough. I was like, why do I stand at that corner with no trees and the sun's beating down on me to watch these two cars and, you know, that have just like destroyed one another. And um, you only really get to experience certain uh, twisted pleasures in a place like Scarborough. You know, <laughs> here, here. I mean, no shade to Scarborough, no shade to Scarborough, but no, you know, no, just, no, no. that's where it happened for me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a there's there's a question here from Kijiro. Hi, Mo. Thanks so much for talking through your writing and life. I'm wondering if you'd mention a few writers you enjoy reading, people who inspire you, and perhaps some who you'd like people to read. Great question. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think Kagura. Um, oi, God. Um, I really enjoy the writers of the Harlem Renaissance. And um, initially, I was, um, I was introduced in high school to Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Are Watching God. Mm -hmm. And um, by reading Richard Wright, I was able to see their reaction to that. And so I realized that there was this complexity in black letters that um, I wasn't aware of because it was just not really, it wasn't made available to me. Um, and by diving deeper into the Harlem Renaissance, I was able to see the, like how many of them, like if it hadn't been for Langston Hughes, for example, or if there wasn't a Claude McKay, I don't think we would have a James Baldwin. You know, mm. and so, and, 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 and people like Langston Hughes or Claude McKay um, made it possible, for example, um, for modern West African writers to have a vehicle in which to express their own experiences that are very unique to, um, to like the post-colonial formations in West Africa. And so, yeah, I, I really suggest that people read Langston Hughes, both his prose and his poetry. Um, and um, boy, who else? There is um, this British writer that I really enjoy. His name is J.G. Ballard. Uh, he writes a lot of dystopian stuff. His Some of his works have been turned into films. One was actually filmed here in Toronto, it's called Crash by David Cronenberg, where mm -hmm. people 
you know, they do things to each other in the midst of a car crash. And, um, and lately I've, um, I've really been getting into uh, Dion Brand and Jamaica Kincaid. Um, it's a real pity that I waited so long to read um, these powerful women from the West Indies because so much of my comfort living in Toronto has come from women from that part of the world. And so to now see, to now see them shine in this way has been a real treat. So, um, so that's really who I'm engaging these days. And um, yeah, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I know that we're, you know, limited for time. We're actually over time, but uh, I, I want to thank you. Thank you so much, Mo, for, for being our guest, for talking thank to you. us about your, your mm -hmm. memoir, Angry Queer Somali Boy. Looking forward to your next, uh, your next book. Uh -huh. Yes, your next book. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, post, <laughs> and, 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 and post COVID, really? looking looking forward to, to doing a, a sitting across sit down at the same time chatting about about your your other writing projects so uh, thank you all for listening uh okay I'm, I'm seeing some more questions coming in thank you all for 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 watching for listening and uh june 27th is actually the day that Blockorama will happen, and so we're 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 in discussion about what will happen that day as it relates to this particular program. It might be in a different form or something, but um, we want to thank you all for listening, for participating, and uh, have a good evening. The rest of us we usually have a conversation happening thereafter. This this live ends but thank you all for listening i'm neil armstrong you've heard from courtney mcfarlane from christopher smith from lance mccready and of course from our guest mohammed ali the author of angry queer somali boy a complicated memoir have a good evening thank you thank you thank you, thank you.